It's time for AgriChat, the official podcast of the Tales of the Agronaut blog and stalwart gaming community, where we talk about stuff and things, and the stuff about the things, and sometimes gaming. I'm Belgast, and let's start the show. Hey folks, it's that time again, time for another episode of AgriChat. This is episode 452, and I am joined by Ammo. Hello. Ashgar. Huh? Kodra. Hello. And Tam. What's up, Chumba? <laughs> it, it, it's amazing how uh, relatable a lot of the street slang from Cyberpunk ends up being. It's and so good. How many times I've called somebody a Chum. <laughs> um, Kodra, this week it was Geek Girl Con. Yes, today was the first day of Geek Girl Con, and tomorrow will be the second. Uh, it's a little local convention in Seattle. Uh, we all got to go. Um, I think for me, uh, they, they kind of have it broken up into a bunch of like panel rooms, a cool exhibitor hall, a fun board game area, uh, like space for indie developers in the Seattle area and like female oriented indie devs to show off their stuff. Um, the science zone had somebody who was doing like, uh, fossil explainers, uh, and he had like a bunch of different resin copies of fossils. And then as he said, and one of them's actually real. Turned out he had a, uh, um, woolly mammoth tooth that you were allowed to like hold and look at, which I didn't think you were supposed to be allowed to do. I don't know. It definitely felt wrong when, uh, my son was holding what he was like, Oh yeah, that's the real one. That's a woolly mammoth tooth. And I was like, Oh my goodness. Please do not drop this priceless historical artifact. But it was really cool. It, it turns out uh, they found a, f- as he put it, uh, it was found in Siberia in ice. So it's technically not a fossil. Uh, it's te- <laughs> Technically, it's fully preserved. Wow. Which makes for interesting paleontology they can do on it. But yeah, it was cool. Uh, There was a bunch of entomologists um, there, and one of them had a tarantula, which she would let, like, crawl around on her hand, which was definitely cool. Uh, Apparently, you are not allowed, she was not allowed to let people under the age of 18, uh, like, put the tarantula on the back of their hands, which implies that she would be allowed to let me put the tarantula on the back of my hand. I'm trying to decide what I feel about that. I assume that's a consent sort of thing. It's what she was like, well, as long as you don't squeeze it, it's not going to bite you. Like, okay. Does it smell fear? (laughs) (laughs) No, no, they taste it. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I've played with tarantulas a little bit uh, because they, it is, it is climate enough for them to be, you know, native here just not super common. Um, and I know like while camping, we would occasionally find them as a boy scout. So yikes. Nope. My seventh grade science teacher had a pair of them. It's a thing. Anyways, uh, the vendor hall was really cool. Um, we, uh, lots of people doing things. My son's really into Kirby right now. And lots of people were happy to supply with cool Kirby art and like other paraphernalia. He went in a his Charmander Kigurami. <laughs> nice. I went in my Fred costume. It was a good time. We played a cool board game that was like you are you are identifying stars that are bits of constellations and like you're getting points as you're discovering new constellations and placing star tiles. It was really interesting. This con always seems delightful. It's really great. Uh, They had uh, the cosplay contest that we got to see. Uh, There was a lot of Owl House cosplay, which was, you know, to be expected. A lot of, uh, still a lot of Sailor Moon. A lot of uh, Legends of Vox Machina, which I do not know enough about. All right. I can see that. See, that does make a lot of sense. Yep. The uh, cartoon made from uh, Critical Role. Yeah, and I've never, like, I have never really gotten too far into Critical Role myself. 
I have watched more clips probably from Dimension 20 than from Critical Role. The show does not actually require any Critical Role knowledge. However, it is not a show for children. That's, yes. But yeah, it's a delightful little small convention. Check out what small conventions are near you. Frequently, they're delightful. Although I... I'll have to check out that uh, series because, like, Critical Role has always been one of those things that, like, I'm interested in the lore behind it. But for whatever reason, performative tabletop doesn't really ever hold my attention. Yeah, I mean, if that's the case, the the cartoon is probably a, a good way to give it a shot. It's definitely like a D&D party full of terrible people. Yeah, it's always the impression I get because I like I have seen Critical Role clips and they're humorous. And then I've attempted to watch an entire session and zoned out. I find, so uh, again, like, so Critical Role is a bunch of voice actors doing a Dungeons and Dragons series. I really like uh, Dimension 20, which is a bunch of like improv comedians doing a, a various types of games, not always like fantasy. I've been watching lots of clips from um, Misfits and Magic. The, the concept being like a bunch of a bunch of very colorful like teenagers get dropped into the setting of a Harry Potter styled British magical wizarding school. Okay. That alone sounds like a fun setting. It's a it's it's very fun. Um the DM uh is doing just incredible character work with all the NPCs. And then, yeah, like the, the players are, they're really into it. I, I highly recommend it. At least watching some of the clips, you can kind of get the idea of what's going on. I find I don't necessarily have the, the, the stamina to get through like a full session, but like the highlights are really fun. So I picked up a, a device uh, that actually came in this week. Um, in my further exploration of trying to make the Nintendo Switch not be a Nintendo Switch. <laughs> or at least not have Joy-Cons. Well. Okay. Uh, like, this has been a thing for me. Like, I don't like the Joy-Cons. I think the Joy-Cons feel awful. Um, and I have tried a series of devices to various, you know, results. Um, they keep getting closer and closer and closer to what I want. But the the Nitro Deck by by Cracked uh, and it's C R K D, which is dumb. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but but like I I have I have commentary on this company that's trying to make collectible devices with a collection system and an app and yeah no like that's all mm. nonsense. Mm. But what they've built is a hard bodied dock of a sort that you slide the tablet portion of the switch into and it clicks like it makes an audible click so it's nice and sturdy and it's not flexible um you know because like the problem that i have with a lot of the larger joy con replacements that are essentially like you chopped a controller in half and put one half on either side um is they don't feel super sturdy um so this is like a whole device that you dock it in and it ends up making the switch feel more like a steam deck, um, which is really nice. Like it, it's got four buttons on the back, like the steam deck does. They're mappable to anything. Um, it's really light. Um, it's lighter than the uh, switch with the joy cons. Um, and it has, all of the functionality save for NFC. So, and like no third party controller has NFC. Yeah, no no third party controller has NFC, but it has Rumble and it has Gyro, which is a step above most of these other devices that I've tried out. That one or, is usually those are frequently missing as well, and that's a little less excusable. Yeah. So like the it's a really cool device. Like it, I got the GameCube purple one. Um, <coughs> there's a Super Nintendo S color palette. Um, there were some limited edition ones that I missed out on that were like, you know, translucent plastic era. Um, like there was an atomic purple one basically, but like it ends up feeling more like a solid device to me. And it feels way better in the hand than 
for me at least than the than the normal uh joy con experience um and also it's kind of cool that you can use the the dock component as a as a wired controller if you really are desperate um so like if for whatever reason you want to put the tablet portion of the switch on a table or something you can use this as a controller i feel like you'd have to be real desperate to want to do that yeah like that's my thought process too like that goes beyond the dog face controller right exactly which i think is perfectly reasonable but like yeah i mean i guess sure they built that in as a functionality awesome um it it essentially connects to the tablet portion through the USB C port uh and there's a pass through that allows you to continue to charge the device um while it's docked in this thing um it's got a really good kickstand if for whatever reason you want to partake of that but again like that makes less sense considering it's a solid piece <laughs> unless you're going to use a third party control like a, a like an additional controller with it but well, I feel like all it has to be is, I mean, if you are going to have it be in that situation, like you're playing Mario Kart or something, like the kickstand on the Switch is terrible, like actively bad. The OLED ones are fine, but like the original version is just terrible. So it makes sense that they would want to build something in that's better than that. Right. Yeah. I mean, it, and it's got, I think, four positions you can put it in and it's like got kind of a ratcheted kind of feel to it to where... It semi locks in place. Um, it's got Hall Effects thumbsticks, so should be drift free. Um, mostly, like the the only complaint that I have is the D pad feels fine, but it's a little bit lower on the 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 device than would make it comfortable to hit the um, left bumpers. But in theory, I guess you could probably map the left bumpers to the two buttons on the left back, and it would be fine if you could get used to that. Um, but like where the D-pad's at, you end up having to move your hand down further than would be comfortable to reach up and hit the the bumpers. Um, like it's it's not a cheap device. <laughs> like it's kind of expensive, but um, it does the thing that I wanted it to do. Where like I have uh a a solid body switch that now feels better than you know the default you know rail attached devices that i've had but like i i feel like i'm one of a very small group of people that would really want <laughs> this thing so like i'm not sure i can you know uh suggest it wholeheartedly because like i'm not sure your use case is going to be anything like mine it is great. Like it seems really good for what it is. That seems it's that's it's such a weird use case to me. Like, but it if it works for you, it works for you. Well, I I I have never played the Switch with the Joy Cons detached ever. That has not ever been a thing I wanted. Um, so this basically just gives me a more stable handheld Switch, I guess, because like by default on the original Switch unit the rails that connect the joy cons always felt like they had more flex than I was comfortable with. Huh? fair enough. I mean, I have giant enormous hands, so that's part of it too. Are you usually playing the switch docked or not? I mostly play it in handheld mode. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I guess it doesn't matter nearly as much for me because I'm usually playing it like on a TV. Okay. Yeah, no, I, it, it's too low res for me to be happy blown up to a, (laughs) A, a, a TV size screen. <laughs> like I've, I've got one of those devices that tries to upscale it and it still is too smooth. Like it's just, mm. I mean, those make it look objectively worse. Yeah. Like, I mean, like, like it doesn't look great. It looks too jaggy by default, but like when it attempts to smooth it, it just looks wrong. It looks like you smeared the screen with Vaseline. Okay. Tam, I know you've been playing Cyberpunk in the 2.0 version. Have you been playing the expansion or have you just been or you just been playing the upgraded base version? So so I pick, I loaded up my old save and realized that they have rebuilt the entire progression system from scratch. So uh and had like rebalanced multiple things through multiple patches. So I was like, whatever, I'm gonna restart the game. It's been long enough. 
uh, it's been long enough that I don't actually super remember it. And there was a bunch of stuff that I didn't do because while I played it and enjoyed it before, the um, like performance was not good. Um, it was like serviceable, but not but not such that I wanted to like do a bunch of side content or things that required um, you know basically required the game to run smoothly because even even on like relatively low graphic settings it was wasn't great um, and I booted it up recently um, to see how the performance like they'd done the 2.0 update which had a bunch of performance stuff and so forth and was and I was pretty impressed at how good uh, the performance was how much of an improvement I had but that was the that was also the point where I hopped into my most recent save because like oh whatever I'll play the new stuff realized that like I don't know if any of these guns are any good I don't know what things I should be using or how to spec this character or any of that so rather than mess around with it I figured I would just play through it naturally again um and finally got around to it uh as part of my uh I finally bit the bullet and upgraded my graphics card. Um, having seen that AMD doesn't seem to want to do high-end graphics cards, and uh, NVIDIA is not doing another one until like 2025, so might as well. Uh, so putting aside the fact that I can, in fact, overheat the thing playing Cyberpunk if I let it, uh, which I don't, but sure could. Um, it got distressing when it when it tipped over the 80-degree mark. Uh, that's Celsius. Yikes. <laughs> um, I was like, mm, it's kind of warm in my office. I wonder what the, oh, I like opened my computer case and it's like an oven. Um, but uh, it runs beautifully. And that's me. And admittedly, that's me turning everything to maximum and saying, go absolutely nuts graphics. See what you can do. Uh, and I have since dialed it back to something a little bit more ridiculous because like I don't need it was like 121 frames per second I managed to cap it out at, which is higher than my monitor can display. So, uh, but the, but the, but the improved performance is great. And there's a bunch of little details that smooth out the whole experience a whole lot. Um, driving actually feeling fairly good. Like driving felt fine when I played in a, like, this is awkward and clunky, but I don't need to do it much. And I can, make it work and like similarly unarmed melee combat and just melee combat in general was serviceable for when i had to do it but wasn't like a thing i went out of my way to do um and i frankly barely even remember the old progression system the new the new thing is actually pretty neat uh i really like they've re they've reorganized the progression system around your stats which i think it already was um, but it's, they're basically trees where the higher you go in your stats, the more of the tree you can access. Um, so you have to spend points to progress through the tree, but also parts of the tree unlock as you hit certain stat thresholds. So the and, thing I remember about progression before was that not all stats were equally useful and therefore it was possible to choose wrong. Yes, that was, yes. And that seems to be the focus of the changes, and I'm trying to find the the new the new system is actually it's really slick uh, because everything passively gets you something, and I keep finding myself wanting to split my points a lot more than I did before because I remember before I had like I was basically a mega hacker and nothing else mattered. And so it was, it's kind of neat playing playing this different thing where I'm like, actually, I do want to split my split my skills around. Um, they buffed hacking a lot, possibly too much. So how does <laughs> what does hacking do in this game? So uh, you are in a world where everybody has cybernetics, or the vast majority of people do. So you can get into people's cybernetics. And do things that are untoward to them. Um, okay. Yeah, I mean, and, you can you can cut off their optical sensors. Yeah, it's it's actually a really wide variety of things. Um, it's everything from like you can do damage to them, which is the the fairly straightforward version. But there's also like, hey, do you want to be sneakier? You can um, you can shut down their you can basically reset their optics so they don't remember having seen you or they can't find you. You can ping, 
which is just pinging all of the <laughs> objects on a network, uh, which is incredibly useful. Um, you can shut down people's cyberware. So like, oh, this, you know, super chromed out, you know, guy actually turns out if you take away all the cyberware, he's just like kind of heavy and slow. Uh, you can jam people's guns. You can, you know, over overheat their stuff. It's there's there's a bunch of neat stuff you can do. It's also the the stat for like hacking into computers and taking info or money or whatever. My my favorite one was the hacks. I don't remember which hack specifically it was, but it would allow you to like basically propagate whatever you just did to everyone in range. Oh my God. It's so good. Yeah. Yeah. You can basically like fire off a virus and everything on the network gets hit by it. Um, yeah, so like somebody like they'll, they'll scream and someone will come to run to see what happened and then they'll catch it. Yeah. And the, the new, um, the old hacking system, I remember it was pretty underpowered until you got real deep into it. And then it was amazing. Mm. Um, because it was like, okay, by the time you're in like tier four gear with enough, with tons and tons of points poured into hacking, it's, it's pretty strong. Um, and this so where you can start doing things like blowing people's stuff up just remotely. Yeah. You could just, yeah, it was just like, cool. I can blow up, I can blow up everything here and take out an entire building with a spreading virus on my own. And the new system, and what the old system had was you could get back, you basically have to uh, use RAM to run your programs and you only have a certain amount of it. Mm. Um, it's, it's mana. It's a mana pool. <laughs> but uh, what they did was in the old version, I never had a problem with mana. Like the, your stuff came back so fast. It wasn't, it wasn't relevant, but like what you could do with it didn't seem that powerful. And they've inverted that in the new system where recovery is pretty slow, but the, effects are the effects are as good when you first start hacking as when you're like deep into it and so everything that you're getting in the hacking tree there's cost reduction it reduces how traceable you are they unlock other hacks that you can do like you can hack vehicles is a is an unlock um and this is like all in the intelligence tree so it lets you queue up multiple hacks to hit different p to hit people at once. It makes you better at counter hacking other hackers. And it's also incidentally the smart weapons tree where smart uh, weapons are like the auto targeting, any auto targeting pistol or whatever. I remember those being bad. Uh, they were, they're not. Okay. Uh, it's especially neat because you can, you can do better stuff. Like I, I'm actually running, Smart weapons are really good for, like, I don't want to go hard into, um, you know, my basic... Like, I don't want to go hard into, like, using an SMG or whatever, but I want to be good at skirmishing. And that's basically how you do it if you also want to be a hacker. It's basically, you need a weapon. You're going to need a weapon to supplant your hacking for the most part, because you can't just hack everybody to death. You don't really have the resources for it. But smart guns let you go super heavy into... Um, intelligence and there's some neat stuff there's some neat stuff where like oh you know killing targets with a smart weapon it restores your ram or um like your your smart weapons scale off of your cyber deck so there's this there's sort of a neat like hacking smart weapon synergy which is pretty cool but but basically every tree is like this and they're all useful and there's a lot of checks that check against all of them so, like, intelligence is your hacking and computers and smart weapon stat. Body is your fairly straightforward, I am I am strong, I am tanky. Um, I can do hilarious things with heavy weapons. Nice. Um, they really like the synergy of, you know, hit somebody with a shotgun and then hit them in melee. Like, that's a really strong thing you can do. Um, you know jump and slam the ground and knock everybody around that's a body thing and then reflexes is you want to be a street samurai you want to be fast you want to be moved you want to use probably use smgs um you it's like the it unlocks i think double jump and air dash 
So like <laughs> there's some movement you can do. Um, yeah, there's a there's a bunch of stuff there. Like technical ability is kind of the weird one to me because it's your lock picking tree, but it's also your like weapon crafting. It's like yeah, it's like weapon crafting. Wasn't weapon it's, crafting an int before? Yes. It's a weird it's a weird one, and it's one that like I've put some points into, but I think it's probably really good if you go heavy into explosives and cyberware. And that's just a weird combination of things. Doesn't seem that weird to me. But you sure can make you sure can make things very unpleasant for people with your cyberware. Uh, and then the last one is cool, which is your ostensibly your social skill, but it's also your I'm gonna be sneaky tree. So it's all of your like use use weapons that you can put silencers on, plus also sniper rifles because you can't put sniper silencers on basically any sniper rifle in the game. Um, that's probably fair. Yeah, like it's it's definitely reasonable. <laughs> oh, thrown weapons. That's the other thing that it's good at. I always find it interesting and weird when a game adds thrown weapons in a game with guns and they're any good. Uh, I feel like this is rare outside of like Warframe. It's fair. I haven't tried them. The the traits that you can get seem pretty great. And I can see some advantage in the th- a thrown weapon is cool because I can I think that you can use it as a melee weapon while also using it as a thrown weapon, which has a lot of value. But yeah, it's uh the the stats feel a lot more even. Like every single one of them I look at, I'm like, okay, yes. And the fact that I've completely dumped body uh has definitely come back to haunt me in a few places where i'm like this would be a lot easier if i uh could just punch this door down which i cannot um but also in general the game is easier uh i definitely had some experiences early on and possibly this was just a performance thing because it really wanted me to be a little bit more more shootery but like i don't have to be anymore and i can try a variety of different things and feel powerful but i definitely didn't feel powerful until i was a good ways into the game whereas now i'm like i feel i feel like i can do quite a lot right off the bat you know it's like no i can't go full stealth assassin right off the bat or like full building clearing super hacker but i don't feel like i'm struggling to take enemies down and like i can actually fight the cyber psychos now which was definitely not a thing I could do before. They ruined me. Um, but the the other thing that I get from the better performance is the story is a lot more compelling because I'm not distracted by weird, weird tidbits. Like, hey, I'm having a heartfelt conversation with somebody, but if I move the mouse at all, it gets juddery. Because um, this game has some of the most incredible first person immersive cutscenes i've ever seen uh but they were being plagued by problems with performance yeah but the performance the performance hit that some of them triggered was like oh this is a cool thing but it's kind of ripping me out of the experience whereas once now that now that there's a bunch of stuff that makes it run better it's like oh wow that's a really cool there's a really cool moment or like that's a really powerful like little gesture that they throw in that i didn't catch before like i i've always loved the car rides as scene transitions but like every so often you know you would clip through another car or something weird while you're the npc's driving you around yeah yeah whereas like one of the characters is an unbelievably terrible parallel parker (laughs) and it there's a there's a dialogue line where that's a where like somebody where the, like your character makes a joke about that, but when when things aren't running properly and every single NPC is like just an agonizingly terrible Parker, like that's it feels out of place. Whereas like you actually get to see him be bad at parallel parking in such a way that's like okay, yes, that's this is actually a funny joke because it's outside of the norm. Um, and the there's also a bunch of stuff that I don't know. It just there's a bunch of stuff that lands better, and I don't know if they've. I don't know how much of like dialogue updates have been made, but but it has some surprisingly nuanced takes on some very sensitive material that it's possible. I I, I remember feeling that when I played it originally, but 
I definitely notice even more of it now. But yeah, it, it's very cool to it's very cool to play through. Um, it runs so, great. The game is beautiful. Like the it, it runs great on a high end graphics card, but like. I would probably want to upgrade if I was going to try and play it. Well, it ran, it actually ran pretty well. Like, remember, I played through it on my old graphics card and it was fine. And I loaded it up before upgrading and it was significantly noticeably better. So, like, yes, I'm running it on, I'm running it on a really high end graphics card now. But, like, even before, even before swapping it out, I, I was impressed at how much better it ran. Like, I so my laptop has a 3060 in it, but it's like a laptop 3060, and it plays Cyberpunk just fine. Which was definitely not the case around release. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, like I I played it on my 3080, and it was great on a 3080. <laughs> yeah, but but yeah, like a laptop 3060 is a significant drop down. <laughs> right, and it still plays fine. Yeah, but but I mean that's a that's a testament to the to the performance boosts that it's gotten. That's good. Yeah, like I've played several times as they've added new content. I've not been back for this major change. And little bit by little bit, they kept smoothing off the rough edges. Yeah, it definitely has a it's definitely of a piece with the like the Witcher series where those are those are often pretty rough on release, but they continue and continue to polish them after the fact. And and this is no different, like. I'm not going to say it's it's like a completely new game, but but it's definitely massively improved. Uh, I have not gotten to the I have not gotten to the uh, the new content yet, which I hear is very good, but I haven't I haven't gotten there yet. Uh, it's fairly deep in. You can you can skip straight to it if you want, but I didn't. Um, I will say that I can't I still can't stand the male V voice maybe it's better if you can get into the into the mindset from like a different background but i also don't know why you wouldn't play corpo why you want to play who you you can choose a background when you start the game and your options are like out of city nomad or like street punk or corpo and they they have some fairly noticeable effects on i mean it's a different it's a different starting uh you know, starting scenario, but it also affects the kinds of things you can say based on your background. Ah, uh, see, my favorite of all three, and I've played all three, is Nomad. Okay. I was about to say, I imagine that maybe you just want to role play something other than a corpo. Yeah, probably, but like, Fair. I feel like Street Kid is arguably the wrong choice. Street like, Kid, compelling. Street Kid is the other one that I started with, and it didn't. I, I was just like, I don't feel like I'm coming at this. With a unique, with a uniquely helpful perspective. Like my first playthrough was Corpo, and I enjoyed it. Um, and then I did a Street Kid, and I, eh, it was okay. Like I get it, but eh, just didn't. I didn't like it that much. And is then it I went that back and, you're you're kind of just uninformed of how the world is works? No, not exactly. Because you actually get some background on like Jackie Wells. Um, you get more as a street kid than you do in the other, um, whatever the, the, the other the backgrounds backgrounds. Yeah. I was, I was losing the word in my brain. Um, but like nomad is really interesting because like you're, you're a cast off from that lifestyle, like, and you've basically been exiled. Um, and then Corpo is also interesting because like you were, played for a fool by you know upper management so like those are very interesting starts and i just didn't think street kid was as interesting i mean nomad at least gives you a car early <laughs> I, I mean that's fair i also think like you you can't there's a bunch of uh minor internet celebrity voiceovers in this game or voice acting in this game and I think you have to be nomad to interact with Alana Pierce's character. Like I do not think you can interact with 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 that character from any other background. Which and that was interesting. But I also kind of feel like in the cyberpunk world, I would end up being a nomad anyway. Like that is the faction that I gravitate towards. Yeah, that's fair. But yeah, it's it's an it's an interesting game, and and I really enjoy it. 
it feels like a successor to the original Deus Ex. And in some ways, I think that it does what that game is doing. I think that it does what that game is doing a little bit better because it's telling, in a lot of ways, it's telling a much more human story versus like layers and layers and layers of conspiracy, which is also yeah. interesting. But but it leans into the layers and layers of conspiracy to the detriment of its characters, whereas Cyberpunk is huge, hugely character driven. I do feel like the point of Deus Ex was to explore all of those like in like the interesting nature of conspiracies and like the shadowy people running the world and like there's a dramatic story to be told there. Whereas this is more like, hey, so it's been a it's been a good uh, couple decades since we did Deus Ex and uh, turns out we have some takes on what the cyberpunk future looks like because it's already here. Yeah. It's a it's a thing where it's a thing where a lot of the it is really, really easy to if I if I wanted to like smear cyberpunk, it would be really, really easy for me to take screenshots to smear it. It wouldn't it would like it would be very easy to do. But in the same way that you can take passages out of cyberpunk novels out of context and that feels it has an it has an air of authenticity that that i don't always see because it's like yeah this sucks we are this is that's the point the point is that this sucks the point and and in universe everybody thinks it sucks like there's there's commentary about hey this messed up thing is messed up and i think that's i mean even even to the point where like oh yeah you're a you're essentially a shadow runner like you realize that's a really messed up job to have. Well, and the game is really good about giving you a wide variety of point of view characters that are at different rungs of the social infrastructure. Yeah. And it sucks at all levels. Yeah. Like, like it wasn't good for the politician. It wasn't good for the police officer. It wasn't good for the rock star. Like, you none of them are happy in this world <laughs> or they're they're attempting to find what happiness they can find in this yeah, horrible and, horrible world and every so often you do find somebody who has found a little bit of happiness and like and a lot of times the game in its narrative bends over backwards to let you defend that oh that's nice which is yeah. really really it it makes the it makes it really satisfying and like it really lends this air to this this air of like, hey, I'm making a difference, which which is cool to see because like it's it's not quite a crap sack world, but it rides the line a lot, and there's some just like messed up stuff that goes on because it's a because it's a dystopia, um, but it's not hopeless, and like it's important that it's not hopeless because that's. That's the whole point of everything is that some people do manage to make it, make things okay for themselves. And that's like worth, that's like worth everybody fighting for, which I, I feel like the is other the right way to thing do that. About the game is there are very few universally bad people. Like there's a lot of bad situations and there are a lot of people who are acting selfish or acting in their self interest, but there are only a handful of people that I would consider truly bad people. You can mess those people up, but good. Yeah. Cause, cause boy, they have it coming. <laughs> it does. That's, that's, I think the, that's, I think the thing, because it's so character driven, it does a, it does a really good job of humanizing people of all walks of life, including people who make, who have like made bad decisions or, you know, are, are, stuck in a bad situation but also when somebody's like actively just a terrible person they, they, they don't they don't try to redeem them it's not it's it doesn't try to say yeah that person's okay secretly like no 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 no. there's a bright line and if somebody's on the on the bad side of that line the game does not pretend to humanize them uh it also it also contains uh one of the one of the first and very few uh, Latin characters who is not 
either a cop, prostitute, or criminal that I've ever seen in a video game, or most media. Granted, it also has Jackie, but whatever. But anyway, it's it's good. It's they have done enough improvements that I that I feel. I think previously my take was I really enjoyed this, but it's hard to recommend. And I think it has improved to the point where I can say, like, yeah, I would recommend this. Well, that's good. I definitely think I need to ch- check it out because I do love me some Deus Ex, right? I love yeah. me this type of game. Yeah, like this is this is the the best Deus Ex successor that I've seen like since the since the I did really like Human Revolution. I think this does more as far as being fun to wander around in an environment. Like you definitely are in the one environment, but because it's one city. But I feel like that's actually really good for this. But like it's a massive city. Yeah, I mean it's a city-sized city. Yeah. <laughs> which, which I think is where it feels good. Yeah, which I think is where it where it does manage to overtake Deus Ex. Because a lot of Deus Ex, it's like you're you're in these little slices of cities, and that's really cool, but you're not getting the like you can't get lost. Whereas you can get lost in Night City. And that's you know, that's a cool experience because you're gonna find something probably interesting. You might also not find something interesting, but separate problem. Would you say that like it just might be kind of dull, or uh, mostly just that you're mostly just that um, it doesn't try to pack content into every little corner, um, which makes the which makes things feel more meaningful. But does mean that like it doesn't have the the like the Ubisoft Christmas tree effect where you turn a corner and like 17 different things <laughs> like that. Yeah, I tend to dislike that. Yeah, like I don't feel overwhelmed by the map. The map has a lot in it, but it has a lot over a, a huge amount of space. Um and I think that's actually really good because the it means that I spend more time walking around looking at my surroundings than I do looking at my map or my mini map. Um and frankly the surroundings are worth looking around at whereas in in games like you know, definitely a problem I have like in Skyrim is I just I'm just watching the map and going in the direction it's telling me. Whereas this has a lot more of oh I want to get up there. How do I get up there? How many different ways are there for me to get up there? Well, that's fun. Yeah, it's 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 pretty fun. So thing that I did not expect to have gotten traction this week, but apparently has, is my throwaway comment last week talking about wanting to make a private league next path of exile league. I mean, Look, sometimes you cause brain worms. Yeah. yeah like it, it's been dubbed the bell league. Yes. Why would we call it anything else? <laughs> and as I said, by the end of it, we will all be beleaguered. I, I would probably like, okay. So, so f- characters for me, if, Guardian does not eat the biggest nerf bat in the world. <laughs> I would potentially do an SS, SRS Guardian. Because, like, I've I've now played that twice. That's a big if. And it fair, is there's really a lot of room good. to nerf it that will still leave it quite good for this particular use case. Like, there's... It's really good on no next to no gear. Um, however, since I always end up making an RF jug anyway... I may just do an RF jug so I can get down into Delve to farm good resources for people. Because, <laughs> like, I mean, without access to trade, I think we will be leaning on crafting resources a heck of a lot more. I imagine we will be leaning on crafting resources. I'm also, like, I have basically been asking myself, do I think it's easy enough to get Hex Blast? into a reasonable position. This also contends that Hex Blast doesn't eat... I'm not going to say nerfs, but specifically Hex Blast mines might eat some nerfs. I don't know if it will, though. Because, like, that build has existed more or less in that state for quite some time. It's just that the North American market took a while, while to notice it. Interesting. So, like, it's... It, it that this is actually kind of fascinating to me because once you start to look at hex blast, you're like, wow, obviously this, this skill is, is perfect for skills. this use case. Yeah, <laughs> like 
I feel like I can explain why Hex Blast Minds is, and I'm still a POE idiot. Like, it's, I think it's been played largely by the Korean player base since 320? Yeah, I, I would have to look at what changes have occurred in that time. I know That's certain... The patch thing, Sandstorm became a thing. Okay, that makes sense. That fixes... Maybe that's it. Maybe having a 4% crit rate was considered that bad, and Sandstorm gets rid of that. It is but it was bad. absolutely played last league, and Sandstorm didn't exist last league. That's true, though. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say, like, there is a way to fix this, because the, like, crit on spell support gets it at least up to 6%, and that's reasonable at that point. That's workable, yeah. Because, like, it turns out, with the way the math works, uh, so, so, like, quick quick explainer, uh, the, cr- the spell crit support adds a flat 2% to the base crit rate. The base crit rate starts at 4%, which is the lowest of any spell. That gets it up to 6%, which is still, like, lower than a... That's about average for spells. About average for spells. But what that means is that that's a 50% increase to the base crit rate and everything multiplies off of the base crit crit rate. Like you're taking that number, whatever the base is, and then stacking all of these like multipliers on top of like an additive set of multipliers. So it's the most important stat when you're looking at crit rate because everything else cares about it. That's why Which weapon is, builds that care about crit, at least even a little bit, need to get crit on the weapon for the same reason. Yeah. And and this is also why Sandstorm, the item we were talking about, is so important, because it lets your spells inherit the crit rate from your weapons, as if they were attacks. Which, there's a wand that has an 8% crit rate, uh, and yeah, you use that, and it basically doubles your crit rate from where you started with. I... I feel like Hex Blast is not necessarily a case that something happened to make it phenomenally good. It's that Seismic Trap got nerfed so that it was no longer good and forced people to look for an alternative. Uh, I'm not convinced Seismic Trap isn't still good. Like I think it still is. I just don't think it's the I can do so The thing Uber that was good about Seismic no Trap budget. yeah, was that it was good on no gear. Which is Se- less true now. Yeah, Seismic Trap was the I'm going to race and kill all the bosses on this with no gear by just throwing some alts against random items. But like, I feel like the downfall of Seismic Trap is what made folks realize, oh, well, this is another trap or another mind build. Well, the other thing that happened was Saboteur got, Saboteur's trap notes got changed. Right. Chain Reaction is still in and still good. But the other one is just gone. It's not in Saboteur anymore. It's just completely deleted from the game. But, like, this has left some room because Seismic Trap is still a skill that has pretty good mechanics that haven't changed, again, in a long time. So people are finding other places to run it, like on Pathfinder. That might actually be a thing I try, because I have not played a Pathfinder significantly. And uh, you would level that build still with uh, Poison's Concoction, which is another skill that is just good. Yeah, it is very easy work. to level with Poison's Concoction on almost nothing. See, like, if I were leveling a Pathfinder, I think I would rather level Toxic Rain as opposed to Poisonous Concoction, because quite honestly, I did not enjoy Poisonous Concoction when I was trying to level a Exsanguinate build. Oh, I love Poisonous Concoction. Po- poisonous Concoction being the thing where you throw your healing potion. You throw your health class. potion. Healing potion. Yeah, yeah, you throw your healing potion, and based on how much... The raw healing damage it does, it scales off of that, which makes it really easy to scale it pretty high off of not a lot of gear. I don't know anything about Toxic Rain. You'll have to explain why that's good. Toxic Rain just does a lot of area. Um, Toxic Toxic Rain's damage projection is very good, even if its damage is not quite as high. So my my way of leveling a ranger... Uh, of choice is to put caustic arrow in my bow with a self cast uh, mirage archer link and then put toxic rain in a ballista in like a four link and use both (laughs) because caustic does really good area um toxic rain just covers a lot with its pods 
Toxic Rain shoots like an arrow into the air and a bunch of pods come down and explode. Yep. It is does do quite a lot of damage to single targets if you can get like the pods to overlap. Right. But you need significant overlap to really do single target. Caustic Arrow does not bad single target by itself. But yeah, we're going to try. I, I've also been calling it the, uh, my idea is like, it's going to be a very communal league. Like we're going to share resources. Like I'm going to try and use my, my personal stash as little as possible and just dump all my currency into the guild stash. Yeah. Like I, I feel like we'll probably need to expand the guild stash between now and then. It's got a currency tab. It'd be fine. Yeah. Like, I, I feel like it might need a delve tab. It might need a delve tab. It might need a delve tab. It also might need an essence tab. Yeah, yeah. It'll be fun working together. We did, so Ash and I did some uh, maps this week together. And you know what? If you aren't trying to do dumb stuff, just being like, I want to play this game with my friends. Let's go do maps together. I don't know if it's profitable or not or anything like that, but it's fun. So, yes. And both <laughs> people get map credit. That's important. Yeah. So, like, I I feel like I got burned on doing maps the couple of leagues when I had no clue how to fix the problems with my characters. If you're dying all the time, you run out of portals. <laughs> yeah, you run out of portals. So, like, I know Grace you're... and I had some problems where, like, we're just dying a lot, so we're out of portals, so that sucks. It turns out uh, that's a really annoying problem to solve if you aren't, you don't have uh, at least a like 101 and 201 courses worth of understanding of yes. Path of Exile. <sighs> like, yes. legitimately, it wasn't until the third league that I played this game that I felt like I was building well-rounded character okay so i'm really feeling like we're hearing i'm hearing consensus because like this is my third league and hey i'm having a blast i really enjoy this game yes uh it, it takes a while for the information to assimilate in your head in a manner that makes sense and is replicable honestly i feel like i got very lucky in that my guide was decently well written and then i was able to start talking more about this stuff and like get like frankly ash and you have been very helpful uh in letting me talk like i've been doing a lot of theory crafting myself like trying to understand what alternatives for like a minds build I could have. And um, spoiler, I think right now Hexblast is kind of pushing out most other mind builds. I do think that Eye of Winter makes a pretty good case for itself, but I do think, I do agree that there's a reason those that you have two mind builds for. Hexblast is kind of, if you want to do a thing that does damage to an area, it's the correct choice as of right now. You can jump through it too. Yeah. I have Winter has different hoops regarding projectile speed and returning projectiles and stuff, stuff like that. If you have a Nimbus, it's probably actually better than Hexblast. Interesting. What's a Nimbus? A stupid, stupid ring. This ring okay. causes projectiles to be filed in random, fired in random directions, but to return to you. Ah, that's so what, it, In practice, what this ends up doing is you just fire a ring of projectiles around you. <laughs> How would that interact with locust mines? Uh, poorly. Okay. Yeah, Extremely okay. poorly. <laughs> Unfortunately. And it, eh, that's fine. It really wants to be used by something that throws out a lot of projectiles at once. Right, which is where Eye of Winter comes in. Eye of Winter acts a bit like Diablo 2's Winter Orb if the orb itself couldn't hit. If you're familiar with how that works. It just shoots a bunch of spiral projectiles and then a bunch more projectiles when it reaches the end of travel. This... Nimbus causes all of those projectiles to, that generally aren't going to hit the same target because they're flying off in the distance to come back to you if you have enough yeah. projectile speed. And, and so Nimbus, this area directly in front of you becomes just a kill zone. Yeah, Nimbus and any of the other things that cause projectiles to come back to you are interesting because they scale based on projectile speed. So the more projectile speed, the further they travel before they return. So you can get into situations where like you can clear entire screens at once. Very cool. 
Speaking of which, I apparently should try to use some of these clear entire screens from distance to learn how to sanctum. <laughs> which is a thing that I think I'm going to be trying to do in this league, the Bell League. I will, I, be, I will happily give you all the sanctum, all the sanctum books, books I get because I won't be doing much of it. I, I do not like Sanctum. Like I, I, I appreciate that it exists. We'll I don't see. dislike it. I just don't play builds they're good at. So I was, I was going to say, I'm actually going to be curious to see. I think a lot of this, this is going to be really interesting, is what they announce as far as changes. I think there's potential for a lot. Like I, I understand there might be some serious changes to Sanctum coming. Yeah, uh, that seems likely. It's going to get watered down without a doubt, like the, the rewards, because there have been a lot of people that have run nothing but Sanctum and just printed endless amounts of currency this league. And in a private league, that doesn't matter because our currency doesn't mean what it you know, normally <laughs> does. Yeah, but, we're not we're not inflating the global economy of a league. Yeah, I mean, divines are for metacrafting. Useful for metacraft. Yeah, <laughs> divines are but, not your trading currency. Divines are what you use to craft really, really good items. But like, like folks who are good at Sanctum, uh, like lots of people have pulled mirrors from Sanctum. There's probably been more mirrors generated this league than in past leagues. I mean, people have also pulled mirrors from Trials, so I'm not. That wouldn't yes. be surprised. That's a thing too, but trial seems way more random with the quality of his rewards. Um, Cause like I've done a decent amount of, I'm up around uh 300, which is supposedly the point at which you start seeing really good rewards. And like the best thing that I've probably seen is six links, which are good, but like significantly less good um, later. Like we have a bank full of six links. Like, that is that is not a thing that we need right now. Um, there are a lot of things that generate them. Heist, for one, generates a bunch of six I, links. I've gotten four six links just today. Yes, but you're currently doing a silly thing. I am magic finding. I blew all of my currency to outfit my character that I liked the least as a magic finder. Because that's what you do with Lightning Arrow after you have geared it to a a point where you can get basic currency with it. Um, so it turns out if you're killing the entire screen at once, you don't really need any defenses. If you can clear all the content within six portals, you need more damage, not more defense. So you can do it faster. Yeah. And so like, I, I am sure I do not have as much magic find as most people do, but like there was absolutely a, uh, Crimson Temple that I ran earlier and got eight raw divine drops. Holy so I find it moly. funny that item rarity doesn't actually affect currency drops. It's just item quantity that does. So putting more monsters on your map and putting more quantity on your everything yeah. are the big things to get like raw raw currency yeah, from maps. It's like a 125 quant map <laughs> with, with my quant, like I think 70% quant is what I have um, off my gear. So yeah, no, like it was a it was a relatively juiced map. Just think, you could have put delirium morphs on it to make it even more more so, and you also would have died. But you know, details. Right, like I don't know how. Like I've not done a delirium or map yet. I should do that to see how this works. Like I'm trying to actually get some levels because this poor character has been dying so much prior to this oh. outing. Um, like it's not today, like but. You know, I'm 92, and it takes a while post-90 to level. It sure does. I am yeah. struggling to get to 90. The achievement for hitting 90 is called diminishing returns. It is a truthful statement. My RF jug this league is level 99. Dang. Nice. I have never gotten a character to 100. I've gotten one other character to 99 before. What is the cap? 100. 100. Okay. Most Impressive. builds basically do not assume you will get past 92 or 93 ever. Um, 90, 90 is a massive slowdown. 95 is another massive slowdown. Yes. Are you going to try and take the RF to a hundred? Depends. <laughs> like I have way more steam at this point in the league than I normally do. Like, so 
This is apparently a thing for people this league. Yeah, no, like this this league has way more staying power than previous leagues have. And I like it's a really good sandbox state of the game right now. And also there's just a lot of stuff to do. Yeah, Sanctum's Um, back, trials are cool. Uh no there is no weird thing to mess around with, like crucible trees, but like the general state of game balance is rather good. Yeah. There's a bunch of fun builds. Like there, there are definitely some outliers. Tornado shot. We're still looking at you. Yeah, uh, I, but... I do look at the leaderboards and I'm like, hmm. Tornado shot seems to be a bit out of band here. But like, tornado shot is a build that requires some of the projectile speed things I mentioned earlier in order to get its damage in, and like it's, it's definitely the meta skill right now. And prior so... to tornado shot, those characters were ice, uh, lightning arrow, or ice shot. Is Tornado Shot a new skill then? No, no not even no. close. It's an ancient skill. Like, I I picked up a Tornado Shot gem and a Fork gem uh, because, in theory, I should be able to just swap Lightning Arrow for Tornado Shot and Fork for Anomalous returning return support, um, and it would be fine. And it, it, it is. I just don't like it that much. Like... <laughs> Even on big open maps, I like playing Tornado or Lightning Arrow way better. Like, yeah, I feel I'm, like I'm over here I, playing an Explosive Arrow Elemental. It's just to see what it feels like, because this is another... Uh, a lot of people play this particular skill for League Start, and turns out there's a reason. I mean, it's pretty good. Explosive Arrow Champion is one of the most well-rounded characters that I've played. I played one last league as one of my late... In the le- like, last league, I made... Seven builds throughout the league. <laughs> this is league, elemental have... arc witch still good. Uh, I think that person, the person who was maintaining the guide, switched to a lightning conduit guide. Yep, yep. It got there's there's some specific there are, things that changed. there are some arc builds that are good, but arc suffers too much in single target for that person to so recommend it. Sad, but so uh, they they replaced it with lightning conduit. What is lightning? So you can still conduit shock do? things to death. Lightning conduit is a skill that consumes shock on an enemy to deal damage based on the magnitude of that shock. Mm. Which, if I remember correctly, in Calandra League was something that Tam was messing around with. It had just like, been added that league. Uh, it's a it, brand new thing at that point. It did get nerfed after that league, but its numbers are still quite good. I had a ton of fun with it. Its numbers are still quite good. <laughs> I mean, if you like lightning bolts, yes. Let let me let me tell you about the wonder of Absolution. I mean, there's also that, but like Absolution is a minion build. Same. That's a minion build. But it, it's a minion build that doesn't feel like a minion build. It's a minion build that requires you to actually cast spells, which is definitely uh, not like a lot of other right, minion builds. Right. Yeah, but like, like, I don't know. It was an, it's an, like, I, I just built one of those and it was interesting, but like, I don't think I'd ever play it again. I, I think it makes say, a kind of bu- bonkers leveling skill for some other minion builds. Yeah. Well, I just threw it on because I, like, sometimes when you're leveling, there are times when the, the quest rewards you nothing that you need. Uh huh. And Absolution was on one of those things. I'm like, sure, I'll try it. And I had fun nuking things in uh, the Toucan League on my SRS Guardian, which would never use it as a final ability. I'm like, eh, let's, let's try this out. Let's build around it. I still think Guardian is a better option for Absolution, though. I mean, this league I've built six builds. All of which are capable of taking down tier 16 content. I've never really found a bosser that I enjoyed, though. Hey, would you like to hear the good news of Hex Blast Vines? See, I'm hoping you get really good at bossing and you can just carry us through bossing. Because <laughs> I don't really like bossing. So here's the problem with a lot of bosses. They have these invulnerability fr- fl- fr- phases in which my Hex Blast stop doing them. So what you're going to get used to is uh, they go immediately into the invulnerability phase. Funny thing about a lot of pinnacle bosses, the ones not called Maven, some of them just kind of die. Like, I know, I don't think you can kill either of worlds without facing him, but I think you can one phase the Searing Exarch. Oh, you absolutely can. I think you can actually one phase either of worlds, too. Huh. Anyways, I'm going to try and learn how to do bossing. So the problem is, is there's kind of what I'm noticing. Um, I was kind of discussing this with Ash earlier this week. There are sort of two different um, 
philosophies to like most of the hex blast people you see on poe ninja are not bossing uh they are they're instead, running sanctum. they're just running sanctum and like so it's like, people's premier sanctum build and, and so a lot of people are just not showing you how to build this defensively you know because like why would you run defenses you're playing sanctum but a lot of bossers don't run much in the way of of defenses as well because they're trying to one phase the boss yeah but they yeah still... but there, there's a level before that in which you need to actually care about taking hits yeah you you still have to take it be able to take a hit but you can't kill shaper without actually you know doing a bit of honest combat not much but a bit well shaper's too long like just to exactly get to shaper you have to have fought a bunch of map bosses on your way Anyways, I now understand uh, a little bit more about bossing. Um, hitting bear trap is really funny with this build. It's funny. I looked at that skill and just missed it as that's probably not that good. But in the context of a skill of a, a mine or trap otherwise doing dumb amounts of damage, well, it's a little silly. It's really silly. I, I like. I'm still not even on my full bosser mode because I know that I can get wilt totems to make my bossing even more ridiculous. I last saw wilt totems used on a uh, Herald of Agony build. I saw recommended them. I prefer Withering Touch support for my personal Herald of Agony build. <laughs> One of the things that hurt Seismic Trap and also hurt a bunch of other Chaos Damage builds was some wither changes went in last patch in 321 that made chaos damage mostly just worse. Well, and, and Temp Chains also got nerfed. Temp Chains got nerfed this patch, which I think was actually the real problem, and they should probably refer to the Wither Changes. But, like, it's left a bunch of skills in a really bad state. Uh, namely, namely, Soul Rend, Essence Strain, Contagion, Bane, are not in a good place right now. What was the change that made chaos damage worse? Uh, the effect of... Wither got worse. Ah, I mostly don't care because Hex Blast is still ridiculous. Yes. And also, Hex Blast gets to go against your target's elemental resists if they're it, low enough. It sure which does. Kind of means that that Wither thing is kind of less important. Oh, does Wither lowest, lower chaos resistances? No, Wither is increased damage taken in the same category as Shock. Ah. Which also, again, Hex Blast is cheating. Yes. Because I'm shocking, freezing, and burning. Strong build. Hey, Kodra, do you want to try these bosses? I will feed you uh, Conqueror and Guardian. <laughs> I, I have plenty of them. You should probably work your way up to uh, seeing how you do in tier 16s first. Yeah, let me, let me see how I do in tier 16s. Yeah, I mean, basically, like, Guardian maps are semi-juiced tier 16s. So you're going to have to get through the, the, the map as well as fight the boss. Probably Elder is the easiest fight of the, the early fights. I mean, you've got your void stone, two void stones first, the quest ones. Yeah, true. The, those are really the easy boss fight. Then See how probably you do with the Black Elder. Star, which you can absolutely one face. Yeah. And the Infinite Hunger, which I don't think, I don't remember if you can or not. You can, you can one phase Infinite Hunger. Um, I have seen someone do it. Infinite Hunger is lovingly referred to as Shrek. But yeah, the Black Star is what people usually demonstrate against if they want to show their build's ability to one phase a boss, because it's the easiest one to get invitations for. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, Black Star and Shrek are not expensive invitations. They're like a couple chaos apiece. Whereas this league, uh, Siri Exarch and Eater of Worlds are both like 1.1, 1.2 divines. For the maps? Yeah, just for the invitation to be able just to Just for the it. ability to fight the boss. Woof. I I am farming invitations, but I'm not running them. <laughs> as soon as I get one, I am selling it. Again, anything that didn't come from Sanctum this league is more expensive than it would otherwise be. Ah, I see, I see. Inflation league. Inflation. Yeah, anything that Sanctum is capable of generating, aka lots and lots and lots of currency... Yeah, that that's that's you know easy. Like, I mean, you can you can tell it based on uh, like how how much chaos you have to to use to buy a single divine. Like two thirty chaos to a divine is kind of on the high end. 
Usually it's more around two. two it's chaos been higher. Around. I want to say it was higher in Calandra. Maybe. That was but also like, the first league that people had to get used to Divines. Yes, it was. And also Calandra drop rates were horrible for a long time. It was like a week. It was long enough that people noped out of it. And it's true. It had, like, Calandra had the fastest drop off of any league ever. And but that was the first. Or? But yeah, um, the price of things equivalent in Chaos Orbs is just very high. This league. Ancestor so far has as good of retention as any league since Ritual. I think Ritual was the last league that had better retention than Ancestor has. How many years ago was that? God, I don't know. Because I was not playing the game during Ritual League. I don't even know when it was. Ritual is just one of those mechanics that's a core game mechanic now. Ritual was 2021. Okay. That is not as old as I expected it to. It was 3.13. Yeah, so basically like Ritual, Ultimatum, Expedition, Scourge, Arc Nemesis, Sentinel, which was the first real league that I participated in, Calandra, Sanctum, Crucible, and so. I thought Ritual was older than that. I did too. I didn't know Expedition was not as old as it feels like it should be. Well, I know I played when Expedition came out. Uh, like, there's a bunch of leagues that I played a little bit when they first came out, but I had no idea what I was doing and I bounced quickly. Like, I remember playing during Heist. I remember playing during Expedition. I remember playing during Delve and Synthesis, but I bounced super early. And I think before Sentinel, the last one I had attempted to play during was Scourge, which was you put an item in a thing and then the world turns into basically a Val Rift kind of thing. Yeah, I've seen a lot of videos of it, but I wasn't you playing during that time. You find a bunch of Beyond Mobs. Well, they're Beyond Mobs now. It was brutal at the time. Like, I remember, like, you know, like like most leagues... You get your first taste of it while you're still just outside of, you know, Lion's Eye. Um, and, like, I remember putting a weapon in it and then just getting wrecked. I also remember the same thing with the first time I attempted to do a Sentinel. I don't know. It, easily my favorite build, build of this league is the SRS Guardian. It's silly. S- like, Summon Reaching Spirits? Yep. I'm not playing SRS. I'm playing Wolves. But... Like, Guardian is silly. Guardian has so much, like, power that you get for free. So what is the power in Guardian? What are, what, what are you guys playing in Guardian? Like, what's the, the things that you are taking? Well, so it's coming out of the Ascendancy Tree. Yeah. So there's there's two nodes in the Ascendancy Tree, and they're, they're, sa- they're down the same path. The first one gives you Sentinel of Radiance, which is an extremely slow minion but it is essentially a righteous fire juggernaut this is believe it or not the less powerful one although it's very good while leveling right so like it moves really slow it's only up for 20 seconds but while it's up you take is it 10 percent or 20 percent less it takes 20 percent of the damage from hits for you yeah it just soaks your your hits for you but also it tanks mobs Ooh. Like, like it will straight up tank a boss and it's dealing a roughly half a screen wide righteous fire AOE while it's doing it. That's anyway, that, that's the, anyway, that's the weaker one. Right. Uh, the stronger then, one. Yeah. Then, then the second one is you get these little minions that basically do buffs. They give you the hang- anger, hate, hatred, and wrath auras, which are. By the way, if you run them on yourself, 50% reservation auras. Wow. You took so you can, Yes. So it's just a huge amount of offensive power in one ascendancy ability. Yeah. And, and if you've got a fast hitting thing like SRS, you have almost 100% uptime. Or Cobra Lash and Wolves or like there's a bunch of ways to do this. It, some hit builds, including uh, Power Siphon, believe it or not, uh, also make very good use of these auras. We may have gone a bit long for tonight, though. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. But yeah, like I, I'm, I'm very interested to see how uh, a private league works out. Yeah. Hopefully, we can get some people to join up with us. Yep. Anyway, that's more than a show. So um, we'll call it here. Uh, any final thoughts? Sounds like no. 
Hopefully you enjoyed the show and we will see you again next week. Good night. Good night. Good night. See you.